topic is plant assets. It's one in a list of several that we used the balance sheet as our guide to get us here. We've covered cash, we've covered receivables, we've covered inventory. This is long-lived assets. Assets that we buy intending to use for a long, long time, for less than a year. There are three major topics that we'd like to talk about. Acquiring them, using them, and disposing of them. And that's kind of the outline of the day and the week. If I get where I need to today, those are the topics we're going to talk about. Buying assets, using assets, employing them in our business, and disposing of them at an appropriate time. One of the things that's important about considering what we need to know about acquiring assets is that we record them at cost. Is this the first time you've heard me say cost this semester? Say yes or no. Yeah. No. I, you know, we're not tallying words, but if we could, would you agree with me that we've said cost as many times as we've said any other word, perhaps more times than any other word this semester? Yes or no? It shouldn't be an unfamiliar term at this point. You should already know the definition of cost. <coughs> cost is all the expenditures it takes to get the item to you and ready for you to use. Now, that's living translation. If we turn to the slide and saw what the slide said about that, it might not be verbatim that, but that's the essence of it. What does it take to get an item to you? Well, what have you experienced about cost? We introduced cost perhaps when we became a merchandiser and started buying goods. And part of the cost was the freight to move those goods from place to place. Well, instead of it being merchandise, let's say it's a piece of equipment and you pay the freight. What are you going to do with the freight? Are you going to debit freight in? Hello? You're going to debit equipment. You're going to debit the same account for the freight that you debited for the commodity. When you buy merchandise, you debit inventory for the merchandise, perpetual procedures. You debit inventory for the freight. That's a past lesson. I'm connecting to what I hope you remember about the past. If you buy equipment and pay the freight on equipment, you debit equipment for the freight. Did you see the connection? Yes or no? And what if that equipment is too heavy to work effectively on this concrete slab? And this is not in good enough shape to handle that new equipment. And you have to tear out the concrete slab and pour new concrete and reinforce it and improve it and put that heavy machine on that to use. What is that concrete? But part of the cost of the equipment. Everything it takes to get the equipment to you and ready for you to use. The manufacturer says when you start producing with that machine, you have to throw away the, the first hundred that it produces. So you flip the machine and sure enough, a little while later, a hundred units have popped out of the machine. Widgets that you're going to sell to somebody. You have to throw them away. What's that? That's cost. That's part of the cost of getting that product ready for you to use. And now you can start using it. Do you understand the distinction I'm trying to draw? Now, your first homework assignment could take you five minutes to do. If your motive is to finish it and turn it in and get it right and get your points. But if you'll look at that problem as full of theory and concepts about cost, if you'll look at the couple of pages in the chapter where it talks about acquiring land and acquiring buildings and acquiring trucks and acquiring equipment and talk about some of the other little nuances that I'm not going to mention today except for an awareness level. One of the things that you need to know is cost and how that affects the long-lived assets that we acquire. I think it's an important theoretical point. The concepts that lie behind the homework are extremely important. Invest enough time to make sure that you've sorted it out. 
One of the things that we need to talk about is using up assets. There are two definitions of depreciation. One is what I consider to be the world's definition, and one is what I consider to be the accounting definition. You might have heard the word depreciation before this week. You might have heard somebody say, I bought a new car and I drove it around the block and it depreciated $1,000. Anybody heard that? Hands up, let me see. Yeah. That concept of depreciation is the world's notion of decline in value. If you buy something and it goes down in value as you benefit from it, use it up, that's one concept of depreciation. That is not the concept of depreciation we're attempting to account for, however. The accounting concept of depreciation is a decline in usefulness or a decline in benefit. We bought the asset to use it up. And as we use it up, we allocate a portion of its cost to each of the years we receive benefit. And that concept is depreciation. You were introduced to that back in chapter four, chapter three. When we started making adjusting entries, you knew how to make the entry to accomplish that. This is the chapter where we need to understand it better and to know why we're doing it and what we're trying to accomplish it, accomplish and how to do it. Depreciation is the attempt that we make to match expenses with revenue in a particular time period. Is that a new definition? No. Not only have you heard cost a lot, you've heard matching a lot. Matching is the one word we use to describe what we're trying to accomplish on an income state to get all the expenses offset against all the revenue in the same time period. And we want to do that with long-lived assets just as we like to do it with supplies or prepaid insurance or unearned revenue or any of the other places where we applied this thinking to match the right amount of expense with the right unit. Now, it's not literally this way. It's figuratively this way. You bought a truck and you plan to use that truck over a number of years. The concept of depreciation is attempting to stretch that truck and allocate a portion of that truck, a fractional portion of that truck, to each of the years in which we get benefit. Not literally that, but the cost of that, the money that we expended at the beginning, whatever we determine cost to be is not an expense of the first year, truck expense, but it's an expense of every year that we benefit from that asset, that's depreciation expense. That's what we're attempting to accomplish. Again, a flashback to chapters three and four. We debited depreciation expense and credited accumulated depreciation when we learned how to make that entry. Debit depreciation expense to match the right amount of expense with the right year. Credit accumulated depreciation a contra asset account to decrease equipment or to decrease the long lived asset by the portion that we used, benefited from. We've been doing that from that point until this, but each of those times we've been told the amount of that entry. It is our job now to determine the amount of that entry, there are four possible ways to do that. There are four acceptable depreciation methods. They are called straight line, sum of, uh, excuse me, units of activity, declining balance, and sum of the year's digits. There are four acceptable depreciation methods. The authors of this textbook have chosen to leave out some of the year's digits. It won't be mentioned. You're not responsible for it. It won't be on homework or quizzes or the final. But it's wrong of me to come in and say there are three depreciation methods. Did you understand what just happened? Yes or no? Yes. I have to say that there are four. We're holding you accountable for three of the four. They're distinctly different. 
And one of the things that would help you the most is as you attempt to learn how to do them, contrast them with the others so that you can understand all of them better. Each of them vary just a little bit of something to accomplish what that one is intended to do. It is our purpose today and this week for you to learn how to calculate the methods. They're fairly easy. They make sense if you'll allow them to. In each of those cases, you're multiplying some amount times some rate. At the end of my telling you this in a few minutes, I'm going to ask you to recall the amount and the rate with me. So pay attention, not just for today, for all times, for this week, for the final thing, but pay attention so that you can respond to these questions at home. We want to multiply some amount times some rate to get the amount of depreciation we're going to record. Straight line depreciation is perhaps the most common, the easiest way to do it, the most adopted by most companies. Straight line depreciation is based on the concept cost, which we've reviewed today, minus a concept called salvage. Salvage is the amount that we expect to use, to, to have as worth of this asset when the asset is finished its usefulness with us. I'm thinking of a timeline. To draw the timeline, similar to the one you saw for the truck a moment ago. So we buy a truck at this point, that's the beginning of the timeline, that's cost. We plan to use the truck for eight years. The end of the timeline is where salvage is estimated, residual value, what we think it'll be worth at the end. That establishes this timeline from beginning to end, cost and salvage. Now, they're different because cost is objectively determined, is verifiable. We've got a check and some invoices and all sorts of evidence that this took place. Salvage is an estimate. We don't know. Your guess is as good as mine. Eh, maybe not, but only because I'm more experienced, okay? It's an estimate, a realistic estimate of what this asset is worth to you at the end. Cost minus salvage. Spread evenly over the life of this asset. I wish the denominator of that just said life. And then there was an asterisk and someplace else in teeny letters it said in years. I want it to say cost minus salvage divided by life. In straight line we define life as years. Five years. 8 years, 40 years, 10 years, 25 years, based on the manufacturer's suggestion, based on our experience, based on our intent. Cars might be 3 years. We might trade in cars every 3 years routinely. Trucks might be 8 years. Buildings might be 40 years, depending on our intent, how long we intend to use those assets. Cost minus salvage divided by life will get you the answer for annual depreciation under straight line. There are two ways to do just this method. Some of you will do it the way I just described. Some of you will choose that because I said it first. Some of you, like me, like to multiply more than you like to divide. Maybe you'd like to use what's called the straight line rate. When you divide one by the number of years you plan to use this asset, one divided by life. You get the straight line rate. Let's see you do some math in your head. What if I thought I was going to use this asset five years? What would the answer to this fraction be? One fifth is a decimal is 0 0.2, 20%. Yes? We'd say the rate is 20%. What if the life of the asset were 10 years? The rate would be 10%. What if I said the life of the asset, four year life? 25%. It's 25%. Yes or no? Yeah. So you could determine the rate and then allocate the cost over the life of the asset by multiplying the concept cost minus salvage times this rate. For a five year life, you'd multiply by 20% and get one year's depreciation. 
for a 10 year life, you'd multiply by 10% and get one year's depreciation. If you like it the first way, you still have to understand the concept for the straight line rate. We use it in a moment in another one of the methods. Either of these, dividing or multiplying, will give you the same answer. Straight line depreciation, you can determine in one of two ways whichever one you'd like to be most comfortable with. Units of activity is probably the least used, but the most accurate. In certain industries especially, where the usefulness of the asset changes from year to year, units of activity is very useful. Let's consider the truck. The truck that we used at the beginning, and you saw me stretch it out and conceptually divide it up in chunks, is one way to do it. That'd be straight line depreciation. But what if you estimated the life of this truck as 100,000 miles? And what if you drove 12,000 miles this year, but 24,000 miles next year? Straight line depreciation would give you the same answer for both those years. You're a trucker. How much are you going to earn in these two years, comparatively speaking? The year you d drove 12,000 miles compared to the year you drove 24,000 miles. Have you figured out the answer yet? Conceptually, how much are you going to earn the next year? The second year? You're mumbling. Twice as much. Yes? You're going to earn twice as much. But under straight line depreciation, the first method, you would allocate the same amount of depreciation to both those years. Under units of activity, you would allocate twice as much expense to the second year. Doesn't that seem reasonable? If we're allocating it based on benefit we received, what a good method to try to accomplish this. Units of activity is cost minus salvage divided by life. Did you hear me? Did what I said override what you see on the screen? I'd rather say cost minus salvage divided by life. You've heard that before. I don't want you to perceive that we're piling on the last week. Here, go memorize 100 formulas or three formulas. No, I'm not asking you to memorize anything. I never have, never will. But cost minus salvage divided by life and cost minus salvage divided by life are the same formulas for straight line and units of activity. How did straight line define life? Say something. In years. years. Units of activity defines the life of an asset as an activity. For a truck, the number of miles you expect to drive it. For a machine, the amount of time, the hours you plan to run it. So if we define the life as an activity, we could determine a rate. Cost minus salvage divided by the activity is a rate. And then when the actual activity happens, we multiply cost minus salvage times this rate. So let's say the truck costs $100,000 and we plan to drive it 100,000 miles. The rate is a dollar per mile. Yes or no? Yes or no? One year you drove it 12,000 miles. One year you drove it 24,000 miles. The year you drove it 12,000 miles, you'd say depreciation expense was $12,000. 12,000 miles at a dollar each. The year you drove it 24,000 miles, you'd multiply the actual miles times the rate you determined and get depreciation to be 24,000. So it would vary directly as the benefit varied the benefit ought to help you earn revenue, this would be the most accurate method to use. To use. The least used, but the most accurate. Units of activity. The third of the three methods is called declining balance. De declining balance depreciation is distinctly different from the other two. The other two were based on cost minus salvage. This one is cost minus accumulated depreciation. If you know the name of that result, 
Would you put your hand up right this minute? If you remember the day I got on my knees on the carpet over there, would you put your hand up right this minute? Yes. That day, the point of me being on my knees was for you to remember this term because it kept coming up. And that's what I said that day. I'm begging you to remember it always because it keeps coming up. And just because this is the last week this semester doesn't mean that it's not going to come up again sometimes in your life. If you're taking accounting too, it's going to come up again. It may come up in another class you take. It may come up on a job someday. What is the concept cost minus accumulated depreciation called? Everybody that knows said, let the record show that more people said it than raised their hand a moment ago. Book value is the idea here. Book value is then multiplied by a rate. That rate is twice the straight line rate. Two methods ago, I told you about the straight line rate. The straight line rate we determined by taking one and dividing by the life of the asset in years. We talked about 20% and 25% and 10% as examples. There's more than one way to do this. That sounds a little better. The only one we're going to do in the book is called double declining balance. We're doubling the rate. A four-year life is 25% double it. Say a number. Let's do better next time. A five-year life is 20% double it. 40%. So we would use 40%. Book value times 40%. What do you think the results are going to be? Equal to straight line? More than straight line? Less than straight line? Just think and say something. It's, if you double the rate, doesn't it sound like this is going to be a whole lot more than straight line this first time at least? Yes or no? It's based on book value. It's book value times twice the straight line rate. Sometimes it's 150%, sometimes it's 125%. You're not going to see those examples in the book. But I had the same obligation to at least mention them like I had to mention some of the year's digits earlier today. Even though you're not responsible for knowing it or we're not covering it, it's only double declining balance for our purposes. I ask you to be aware that every situation was multiply some amount times some rate to get an answer. The amount we use in straight line is a constant. It's cost minus salvage. A constant amount, cost minus salvage, times a constant rate, the straight line rate, 20%, 20%, 20%, and so on, will yield what? Would you like to guess? Describe it to me. What's the answer going to be? Constant. Come on, more than one person should say? Constant. A constant. Straight line depreciation will yield the same amount every year. Declining balance depreciation on, oops, let's graph that. Let's say that we've got two axes. We've got one that's the amount of depreciation we're recording and one that's the life of this asset, the years over which we're going to record it. And the first year I determine the amount of straight line depreciation and I go up and across and draw me a dot right where that amount of depreciation is. In the second year I make the calculation, I go up and over and put a dot there. And the third year, and the fourth year, and so on. And I use a ruler to connect the dots. What's it going to look like? But uh, straight line. Again, a term carefully chosen to communicate. All the accounting terms are that way. If you listen, they talk to you. Cost of goods sold is a good example. Straight line depreciation. If you wonder about the formula, you ought to think, now I've got to come up with a formula that's going to yield the same amount every time. Cost minus salvage divided by life, or cost minus salvage times the straight line rate will give you the same results for a full year of depreciation every year. Declining balance, on the other hand, multiplies a declining amount, book value. Could you think a minute about straight line being cost minus salvage and declining balance being book value? 
You saw it earlier. Yes? Yes or no? Talk to me about book value. Does book value get larger every year, stay the same every year, or get smaller every year? Smaller. It gets smaller. That's your term. My term for it gets smaller is declining balance. Did you hear it? So when you read a quiz question, when you read a homework problem, when you read a final exam question, when you read something next semester, when your boss asks you to use declining balance, let the words talk to you. Declining balance. Are they talking yet? It's not cost minus salvage that's going to be the same every year. It's based on book value that's going to be smaller every year. It's based on a declining amount. And to that, we apply twice the straight line rate. That becomes a constant. Do we double it the first year and then double it the second year and then double it the third year and then... No. You double it one time. Twice the straight line rate, you double it once. And multiply that constant amount, 40%, 50%, whatever it turns out to be times book value, which is getting smaller every year. If we were to graph double declining balance depreciation, we would see that it would be larger than straight line in the early years and less than straight line in the later years of the asset's life. It's called an accelerated method. You ought to look in the book for that expression. It writes off the asset faster in the early years than in the later years. It takes more depreciation early and for tax purposes is the most popular of the methods. Declining balance depreciation takes larger amounts of expense early and saves tax dollars that you can use to help pay for the equipment that you bought. That's the idea. Lowers taxable income, saves taxes. Declining balance depreciation is an accelerated method because of what it accomplishes. It's a vocabulary term. We've talked about buying them and the importance of recording them at cost. We've talked about using them and knowing the formulas, straight line, units of activity, and declining balance. Let's talk about disposing of assets. If you just thought about it, if you just applied logic to it, it seems that there are three ways we could get rid of an asset that we were finished with. We could simply throw it away, discard it. We could sell it and try to get money out of it. Maybe if it's not useful to us, it would still be useful to someone else. They would see value in it. Or maybe we could use this asset to get another asset. We could trade this asset for another asset. Let's talk about these. One of the things I need to grab your attention with right this minute is that I'm going to lay a foundation and build on that foundation. Each of these entries has this component in it. It gets just a little progressively more detailed, but they all start with this. Let's back up one step. When you buy an asset, you debit equipment and credit cash. Now I want to get rid of that equipment. Does it make sense to you like it does to me that I want to credit equipment? If I'm getting rid of the asset, doesn't it make sense that I want to credit equipment? Yes or no? Now, we invented accumulated depreciation to take the place of the credit side of this very asset. Accumulated depreciation doesn't exist without equipment. If you get rid of the equipment, it should also make sense that you get rid of the accumulated depreciation that goes with it. It's the same account that we've chosen to account for in two accounts. To get rid of an asset, it depends on whether it's fully depreciated or not. But if it's fully depreciated, there will be no gain or loss on the transaction. If I thought this asset was going to last five years and I threw it away in the seventh year, it's fully depreciated. Do you understand what I just said? If I bought this asset and said at the beginning it was going to last five years, but I threw it away in the fourth year, it's 
not fully depreciated. I've got this depreciation left to take. Yes or no? The question you've got to entertain when you throw it away is, is it fully depreciated? If it's fully depreciated, then let's just get rid of it. Credit equipment and debit accumulated depreciation. That's where every entry in this series starts. Every entry in this series will credit equipment and debit accumulated depreciation. It just so happens in this case, they're the same amount, so there are no other consequences. Throw away the asset, credit it. Get rid of the accumulated depreciation that goes with it, debit it. Now, if it weren't fully depreciated, this entry wouldn't have balanced. If we throw away an asset that has some book value left, then the amount of the book value is going to be loss on disposal of that asset. The depreciation that we would have taken in the future, we are taking now, but we're calling it loss. If the line was estimated to be five years long and we shortened the line to four years, the depreciation we would have taken in the future is now a loss of this year and expense. If we sell an asset, it's just like the others except we're going to get money for it. <coughs> if we sell this asset for exactly book value, we have no gain and loss. If we sell this asset for more than book value or less than book value, we would have gain or loss respectively. Sell it for more than book value, that's gain. Sell it for less than book value, that's loss. And that's not really accounting, that's just common sense, that's business. That's the same that you would conclude had you not taken this course, or your parents would conclude, or your uncle or your aunt would know. That's just how things work. But the accounting impact of that is how does it affect us in terms of recording it? If we sell an asset for exactly book value, we need to get rid of the asset by crediting it. We need to debit accumulated depreciation if we get rid of it. This is just like the first entry we did except we introduced cash into the formula. We need to debit cash for the amount that we received in cash. Finally, two potential situations could possibly exist depending on the amount of cash that we receive. If we receive cash greater than the amount of book value, we would realize a gain. Selling the asset for cash less than book value would cause us to incur a loss. The journal entry to record such situations would credit equipment to eliminate it, would debit accumulated depreciation just as it has in previous examples, would debit cash for the amount you received in cash, but would debit loss on disposal of equipment or gain on disposal of equipment depending on what the circumstances were. This reminds me a little of cash short and over in a previous chapter, where cash short was a debit and cash over was a credit. Loss would be debit like an expense. Gain would be credit like revenue. So loss or gain on disposal of assets would complete this entry and would cause it to balance. This would be selling an asset for greater than book value or less than book value. Your fourth homework assignment is about this very topic, about disposing of assets. Would you help me get the attendance sheets and have a great